that means you're looking at a, at a decline in, in the price of risk assets on the order of 20 to 50 percent from here stocks have already sold off 25 percent. you think from here more 20 percent to 50 percent more well let, let, let's put this i don't even hyperbolic i'll leave that to other people um but i'd be shocked i'd be shocked if the s p wasn't below three thousand in the next three months It's my pleasure to welcome back George Noble, creator of the Nope ETF and a phenom on Twitter spaces. Thanks for having me, Jack. Back, Jack. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. George, the last time we did our interview was on May 3rd, and the markets have moved in a remarkable fashion since then. And you know, when we did our interview, you told me that equities represented return-free risk. How has your thesis evolved since then, and, and what are you seeing going forward? Yeah, you know, markets have... Uh kind of gone in the direction that we uh, anticipated. I'm reminded that um, you, know, you can forecast price, you can forecast time, but never give the two forecasts together. In a direction hard is, is, is hard enough. Um, so the direction hasn't been a surprise. I think some of the moves maybe have. Um, you and I were talking earlier, I mean, I think the 10-year yield has jumped from by 100 basis points from 290 to 390. I think uh, two-year yields are up 150 basis points from maybe 280 to uh, 330. S&P, I was just checking these numbers before we came on, is down 12%. Um, ARC is down 28%. And Bitcoin's down 50%. So if you recall, Jack, part of the idea was that um, we were most concerned about liquidity-driven assets. Uh, as Michael Howe of Cross Border Capital um, has uh frequently pointed out markets are all about liquidity. And I know Jack, you've had him on a couple of times and he was really prescient in his call going back a year ago that uh, as the liquid title liquidity started to go out, this would pressure risk assets. So the direction has been right. Um, nothing goes in a straight line. Nothing's linear. Uh, markets had a pretty good correction after we last spoke. We then had the summer uh, counter trend rally. Uh, bond yields actually went down for a couple of months. Uh, equities are captive to bonds. Um, but, you know, counter trend rallies, they're really a, um, they're a feature, not a bug of, of bear markets. Bear markets are hard. Um, so directionally, things have gone right. I think um, if you consider, if, if, if you told the average person, probably if you told me that rates would go up as much as they have, that something would have broken by now. Now, I did say in that, in that uh, interview that we had together, that I thought the economy would be able to withstand uh, much higher interest rates. But it's not just the extent of the increase, but it's the speed of the increase. I mean, when you have the 10-year yield rise by 100, 100 basis points, it's a short period of time. Again, the two-year rise by 150 basis points. The magnitude in combination with the speed, it lends itself to uh, increased volatility Probably some economic actor somewhere being caught out of position. Witness what we saw with the UK pension fund situation a couple of weeks ago. I mean, two weeks ago, to use the vernacular, UK pension funds weren't a thing. Okay, all of a sudden, everyone's an expert in UK pension funds. Okay, but it's the old cockroach theory. There's never just one cockroach. And so I fully expect there's more where that came from. So um, the song remains the same, just with more gusto, I guess I would say. Yeah, that, the pension crisis, the UK pension crisis, it was kind of a stay of in execution, uh, to use Jim Bianco's phrase, where the Bank of in England intervened, offering to buy up to $5 billion of, of guilt a day. But that's en we're recording on Tuesday, October 11th. That's going to end uh, on Friday. So it would be interesting to see. After the Bank of England stepped in, I mean, there was literally no buyer for UK guilt. Think about this. This is not the Banana Republic. This is a major D G7 country. I mean... The oldest bond yeah, and so and so you think about you know it's not just is there some leverage speculator caught somewhere, but is is the UK perhaps a harbinger of things to come for the system more, you know, on a more global basis? When when you start having expansive fiscal policy uh, at odds with contraction and monetary policy, because global money supply, as Michael Howell has taken great lengths to to, to to highlight is falling at a pretty prodigious rate now. And, and if the central banks carry on with their plans with QT, you're going to see continued liquidity tightening. But the, but the question is, when you have expansive fiscal policy meeting contractionary monetary policy, 
that's a combustible uh, mix. And so I know it's not the question you asked, but I was thinking about this earlier. One looks at interest rates and normally people would say, well, what's inflation? And then depending on the, uh, the maturity of the instrument you're talking about, you'd ask a risk premium to it. And people would say, well, real rates are this, and tips should be that, and so on and so forth. Well, there's another way of looking at this. Interest rates represent nothing more, and it's the price, supply and demand for funds. So when you get into an environment in the depths of the um, COVID crisis, where they create trillions of dollars out of thin air, it's got nowhere to go. There's a, there's a, there's a glut of savings looking for a home. And so the, the, the price of, um, of, of money gets bid down, 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 down. And, you know, everyone took, everyone took that low cost of capital and went out and engaged, bought an asset with it, engaged in some type of financial speculation. Now it's going the other way. You have the, um, central banks, you have the Fed who's stopped buying bonds. You and I were discussing earlier, you know, if they follow through with their plans for QT, you're actually going to see them selling bonds. It remains to be seen whether they'll follow through with that, given what's going on. But they're not buying bonds anymore. Foreign central banks are selling bonds. You look at um, uh, U.S. treasuries uh, held by foreign entities at the Fed, that's going down. Um, and then you have, and you have um, commercial banks. They're not buying bonds either. So it kind of begs the question, who's going to buy the bonds? Coming at a time when it's not just you're looking at the budget deficit increasing, probably further augmented by some of the additional stimulus packages that you know is coming out. We'll get to it later, but you know I'm sure you've seen Jack in Europe, one government after another offering uh, some payments to defray the higher energy costs. I think in California they're doing that now already. So anyway, you're going to see increasing uh, fiscal of uh, uh, increase in fiscal policy at a time when if the central banks follow through with what they're saying. They're not only not going to be buying bonds, they're going to be selling bonds. And so I just kind of wonder, just as rates have gone up a lot more than most people thought, I wouldn't rule out that continuing to be the case until something actually breaks. And the question is, at what point will something break? As um, we were in a space together the other day, and as uh, uh, I think it was uh, Bobby J pointed out, we're not in a uh, really, what we've been been through is is a, is a, is a duration bubble more than a credit bubble. Cause you know, credit spreads were pretty well behaved. You know, I think, I think all of us would have said, if someone gave us today's Wall Street Journal at this turn of the year and said, oh, the 10 year is going to be at 390 and the two years going to be at 420, you'd say, oh, well, spreads have to have gone, gone to the moon. Well, it's actually kind of remarkable how well behaved spreads have been. Instead of what's happened, we were witnessing the unwinding of a duration bubble, massive amounts of leverage used to buy bonds. And if you just look at the 10 year, let's just use that as a risk free rate that off of which so many other risk assets are priced. Um, 10 year now approaching 3%, 4%, 4%. And you think about, you put a spread on top of that for investment grade or a spread on top of that for uh, uh, for John to spread on top of that for equities. I mean, basically what's happened is he went through this sustained period of time, this whole uh, regime post GFC where we suppressed the, um, the risk-free rate. And on top of that, as animal spirits uh, manifested themselves, um, uh, the risk premium also came in. So you had depressed risk-free rate and depressed uh, uh, spreads. So what, the 10-year bond, I think it was at 60 basis points a couple of years ago? Okay. I mean, it wasn't that long mm-hmm. ago that the bunny yield was like zero or whatever. And so now the question, right. question is, everything that was bought, you know, use, people using that as, as, as their benchmark and going out and making and buying at risk assets with that as your cost of capital, you now reprice that with a higher risk-free rate and a higher risk premium. And we now start to engage in price discovery. and it's a problem. So I am not as comfortable as many are. The consensus seems to be that bond yields have to stop here. Um, I have no position on bonds, but um, I've been you know, certainly negative on bonds for a good part of the year. Once we got the three and change, I was like, all right, whatever. There, it's not, I'm not a bond guy. There are other things to, 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 to play with, more interesting, interesting things. At heart, I'm an equity guy. 
But I, I think this whole repricing of risk assets globally, this is a sort of semi-permanent uh, step change. And what people don't quite understand or haven't fully come to grips with is that whereas in the, in the post-GFC environment, every decline has been met with more, more liquidity injections from the central banks, that's not going to happen this time. And so you've got a sort of permanent, I'm going to use the term permanent for the context of the next few years. I'm not saying forever and all time, but a permanent uh, step function increase in the risk-free rate and a permanent step function increase in the risk premium. And you put those together, um, you know, as I think it was a great feed the other day on Twitter, back of the envelope, I, I don't believe I have a mouth on the truth, but as it pointed out, all things being equal, which they never are. That means you're looking at a, at a decline in, in the price of risk assets on the order of 20 to 50%. And, and, and the worst part- From here, from, stocks have already sold off 25%. You think from well, here, more 20% to 50% Well, more. Let, let, let's put this, I don't leave it hyperbolic, I'll leave that to other people. Um, but I'd be shocked. I'd be shocked if the S&P wasn't below 3,000 in the next three months. We are really looking at a two-phase uh, bear market, which is kind of like the opposite of the two-phase bull market. Uh, as he points out, you know, coming off the COVID lows, first you had this huge liquidity injection, which drove up valuations. Eventually, as the economy kicked in, earnings manifested themselves. So you went from the liquidity-driven phase of the bull to an interest-driven uh, phase of the bull. Now we've done the opposite. We, we, we've gone through, we're going through the liquidity-driven contraction, the PE compression as rates go up, and that game's not over yet. But we're just starting to see earnings fall apart. I think earnings estimates are way too high, way too high. Um, you can go back and look at the data. I'm sure you have. Um, but typically, you know, to see earnings fall 20 or 25 percent in a recession is, uh, is, is, is par for the course. Um, there are reasons to suggest, in my opinion, that it could be worse this time. I'm happy to get into that. But if we just use the napkin math and we say S&P earnings are tracking it 220, 230, and we mark them down 20, 25 percent, you know, to start the conversation, Jack, let's start off 170, 180 for S&P earnings for 2023. And with a market at 3,600, this is the napkin math, that's giving you like a 20 plus multiple uh, on the market, which if it bottomed here would be one of the most expensive valuation levels in history that accompanied a market, a market bottom. So, you know, I, I think, I think earnings, you, you know, we were, we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for earnings to roll over. You started to see already in the third quarter, since the beginning of the third quarter over the last two months, Earnings estimates, I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but I think earnings estimates have, have tailed uh, for the quarter have, have come in by 7 or 8% or some number like that. It might be 6, it might be 10. So estimates are already yeah. falling. And um, I think people are going to be surprised, very surprised by how much they fall. But the most, but coming out of this again, it's not just that we were completing or, or in the late stages of the multiple compression part of the bear market. We're beginning the earnings compression part of the bear market. And then the most important point, I think, is the element of time that we've been accustomed to in the uh, post GFC era that when it, 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 it all pain, uh, BF Skinner, all pain, pain is temporary. Okay. And then we go back to our normally scheduled program, which is we buy up and to the right. No, that's not the way markets work. Um, we've not had a proper bear market. By that, I mean the element of time where investor expectations um, uh, get dashed. And I think that's going to cause people to change their psychology, their outlook, their behavior, which gets to another point we talked about last time, which was positioning. You've had, uh, I believe it was over a trillion dollars of buying by the investment, by the retail public last year. George, you're making a lot of great points. Let me jump in there and just explain a few points uh, to the audience. So stocks uh, have profits, or at least they should have profits. And the S&P 500 is is an index that owns all the stocks. And you have realized earnings, what stock they earned in the past. And then you have earnings expectations, what they earned in the future. And then you discount those future cash flows back to the present using a discount rate, which is comprised of two things, uh, interest rates or like risk-free money 
yield and then uh, equity risk premia, or in the case of bonds, like uh, credit risk premia or, or whatever. So you're saying so far it's been the valuation has sh- shrunk because of the interest rate thing. So the, basically the, because the future is worth less because interest rates are higher. But you think so far uh, earnings expectations, the people who work at, on Wall Street, the sell side analysts, they are way too rosy in their earnings outlook. So for example, Goldman Sachs recently put out a thing saying, if we have a recession and if we have a bear market, the S and P 500 could earn as little as two hundred dollars per S and P 500 unit. You think that's way too high? Way too high. In fact, I don't have the figures to hand, but I remember uh, looking at these uh, over the last few weeks, and uh, it's not uncommon. You've seen rates go down, profits go down twenty, twenty-five, thirty percent in the past cycles. Um, so if you're taking, if you're saying two hundred for twenty-three, I'll take the under on that. Um, but you know, even if you took two hundred. Which I think is ludicrous. Again, napkin math. With the S&P at 35, 3,600, to having the market bottom at 18 times earnings, uh, I know you've seen the data we, and we can post it, but um, that would be a pretty rich level for a PE ratio um, at a market bottom. It's a really a very tight labor market. And it suggests to me that companies are going to be hesitant to shed labor uh, that readily because it's been so hard to attract and retain labor. The only way they're really going to start shedding labor in, in, in size is if their profits get whacked. So it's almost like a tautology. You can't have the softish landing. It just goes back to our, I remember one of my more outspoken moments in our interview back in May. You either can have your recession and, 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 and you know, good luck with your earnings and good luck with the stock market. Oh yeah, and in that way you will free up, you will create the slack in the, in, in the economy, you will free up labor to get inflation to come down. Or if you don't, good luck with the inflation. And so let's talk about inflation for a second. Everyone said, well, it's peaked, it's peaked. Well, this is the same crowd that told you it was transitory. That it's peaked, that it's peaked is not the issue. I can believe it's peaked. Not the issue. With respect to the talking heads, the issue is the trajectory and the speed by which inflation declines. If you have unil- if you have wage gains still running at five, five and a half percent, that's not consistent with a world of two percent inflation. You really got to get wage gains down to three, three and a half. The only way you're gonna do that is by laying people off. Now I don't want to get into politics, but we live in a very politicized world, as, as we all know. And so there are some who say, oh, my God, you, you mean you want to throw people out of work? Well, I'm not, I don't want to be a you know, heartless person. But what happened was, you know, in the wake of the COVID crisis, the pandemic, we really overcooked the goose. We threw trillions of monetary stimulus at the system, trillions in fiscal stimulus. So what did that give us? That gave us, you know, peak liquidity peak stock prices, peak... 9% nominal GDP. Yeah, okay, okay. It's too much. It's too much. It's like you, you, you have the patient in the emergency room, you shoot all these steroids into them because you don't know what's going to happen. But it's possible you could do too much. And that's what we did. Mm-hmm. And now we're dealing with the after effects of that. So um, there is no softish landing here. It, it really is wishful thinking. And it's completely at odds with economic history. I mean, I think there's been maybe one example where it's happened. But if you're in a world of you know six, seven, eight percent inflation, and even now with the with the with the two year paper at what four point three percent or whatever, you still have nominal interest rates well below the um, the growth of the economy. Now, I fully appreciate if you are running a private equity fund and you're levered up five x and your cost of money, you know, it's LIBOR plus. It just went up three hundred basis points. It's a problem. I totally get that if you're a platform company and you're levered five or 10 X investment company, it's a problem. But I think we could be in one of these phases where, as opposed for so many years, Wall Street was uh, doing better than Main Street, that perhaps Main Street is going to do better than Wall Street. And actually, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I, I think, I think the incredible speculation that we've seen whether it's, you know, collectibles, baseball cards, Bitcoin, uh, profitless unicorns, art, just go down the list. Um, 
it's it's malinvestment writ large on steroids. There's no it's harmful economic activity. And I don't want to get on my uh, become too moralistic about it. But, you know, it's kind of fun. You've heard me say this before. We've we've had a massive underinvestment in extractive industries, most notably oil and gas. And ESG has only compounded the problem. Policies that are being pursued right now are not doing anything to increase supply. You know, if we if economy slows down or recession, okay, oil price will go down maybe, but that's because demand's going down, not because supply is picking up. And so all it means is we can get a recovery again, it's going to be right back in the soup. I don't have the figures to hand, but just ballpark uh, order of magnitude, interest here is accuracy, not precision. I seem to recall, I think total energy capex in the United States last year was, I don't know, 100 billion, 150 billion, some number like that. Okay. Yet, and someone will correct me on this, I think the amount of money spent on uh, Tesla stock option premiums was in the hundreds of billions, if not trillions. I mean, to me, that defines malinvestment. It's a totally unproductive use of capital. So rather than bemoaning that some food delivery company is going to go bankrupt or some dating app is going to go bankrupt, I hate to see, to be like a, you know, a bitter old man, but this malinvestment, it, we, people just been incinerating capital. Now, as the cost of capital increases, and this stuff has to get priced to, to market, we'll see what's real and what's not. And I actually think people, once people get the memo that, you know, XYZ unicorn that's burning cash and should never come public, once they lose enough money in one of those things, maybe they'll start to get the memo that they shouldn't be trafficking that kind of stuff. And maybe they should get back to what investing is real, really all about. You know, I often we talked about Peter Lynch last time, you know, know what you own. So many people like to invoke Peter Lynch, know what you own. Problem is, so many people don't know what they own. They have no idea. They don't study the balance sheet. They don't study the cash flow statement. Or they buy an index fund which is basically nothing more than a large cap momentum uh, momentum strategy. So I actually think this is all part of the healing process um, that, you know, we need to stop chasing narratives and dreams and get back to real investing, paying attention to valuation, uh, paying attention to fundamentals. Is the bull market in narratives over? <sighs> Look, you never want to say never. But I believe it is. I mean, you look at, uh, there are certain indices, I'm sure you, you follow them. Uh, I think Goldman Sachs has, a, has an index based on retail favorites. Um, you know, it's, it, it's horrible. Also, you look at the trading activity, particularly the options activity, and a lot of the meme stocks and story stocks, even though the market, whatever, that line's completely collapsed. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I think it is. I think it's a good thing. Uh, you know, think about it, think about it, think about it, Jack. How crazy was it that you had David Portnoy rolling dice out of a bag, okay, and, and, and picking stocks based on the letter that would come up, and then schooling Warren Buffett, saying that Warren Buffett's washed up. Like, what's wrong with this picture? And he beat Warren Buffett. He I know. For time. I know. He, he did beat Warren Buffett. Wait, you've heard me say this before. Sometimes the market looks, makes you look smarter than you really are. And sometimes the market makes you look dumber than you really are. And the thing is, you know, people don't just become dumb and smart. Let's pick an example of someone who's really bright. Take Jeremy Grantham. You call him early. You could say maybe he was so early he was wrong. But they don't really come much smarter than Jeremy Grantham. And I've seen this happen time and time again with Jeremy. I can recall 87 when I was a young bucket fidelity and I drank the Japanese. Kool-Aid. And I was all in a narrative-driven Japanese real estate stocks. So I started in that movie. And there were folks like Jeremy Grantham who was railing away in the late 80s. Japan's a bubble, Japan's a bubble, Japan's a bubble. Problem is, you get into a bubble, it's next to impossible to pick the top. The Nikkei peaked at 39,000 roundabout in the last day of 1989. The only decision you had to make for the next 10 years, 20 years really was just underweight Japan in an international equity portfolio. In 1999, 
Jeremy Grantham told the story, I think it was in 2004, it was a Grants conference. Around about 1999, Grantham was refusing to partake in the tech, mania, tech mania that was ongoing. And he was banned from making an appearance in the General Motors uh, investment office. I think he had them as clients or past tense had them as clients. Mm -hmm. He got fired. He, a memo was written, it was a, by the CIO of GM a pension fund, uh, circulated internally, that Jeremy Grantham was not allowed to enter the office on the grounds that he was deemed to be a dangerously persuasive person. All right. Grantham Mayo's assets, I believe, from 95 to 99 or thereabouts, went from 40 billion to 18 billion. And I don't think they actually lost any money. I think it was just FOMO on steroids. It's like Jeremy's not just outflows. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah we're gonna give the money. Yeah, outflows. You want to give it to some some narrative chasing, you know, kid. Yeah, and I, like me. I, I remember in February of twenty of two thousand, I have it taped up on my wall somewhere. You read those class. You can observe a lot by watching. As Yogi Berra once said, one of those classic all time quotes: "If it's not tech, it's dreck." In other words, in other words. It's, it's tech or bust, okay? Well, yeah. Jeremy had the last laugh. GMO's assets, having gone from 40 billion to 18 billion, went in a straight shot to 140 billion. And then Jeremy liked to tell the story that uh, in 2004, or there about 2005, he was sitting on the investment committee of a major institution. And one of the questions he asked any prospective manager was, how much were you up in 2000 or 19, 1999? Right. The answer was, oh, more than 15%, you did not get hired. Because if it was more than 15%, that, mean, that means you, 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 you consume too much Kool-Aid. And that's why, you know, I don't want to be too hard on she who shall remain nameless, who runs a very well-known, uh, um, you know, ETF that invests in losing-making companies. But I have no idea who you're talking but, about. But Jack, we, we talked about this last time. We've seen this movie before. There's nothing new here. Yeah. There's nothing new here. But George, so it's, it sounds like you're not just bearish, but exceptionally bearish. How many times, and by the way, I said, you said you, you were sitting next to Peter Lynch. People should know, I, I didn't introduce you at the beginning, um, but you were the right-hand man to Peter Lynch. You rode the Japanese bubble up and down. You run multiple uh, hedge funds with over a billion dollars asset management. People want your background. They should uh, go to our first video, which aired on Bloomberg's Macro uh, on May 3rd. But I just want to give that context. So, you know, you've been in the business for a long time. How many times in your career have you been as bearish as you are right now? It's a great question. And I need to preface that by saying I was inadequately, um, uh, I wasn't sufficiently bullish uh, for the prior few years. In fact, I was bearish excessively. Um, but, you know, I can recall, for instance, in 1999, I started to get negative in the fourth quarter of 99. And by March of 2000, when the market peaked, I was like, you know, losing my mind. Well, I made it up in spades thereafter. Uh, NASDAQ declined by 80% over the next two years. Um, I, I was on the wrong side of the market, or at least not participating in the market uh, the prior uh, two, three years. But it's the old line, Jack, you know, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. Um, in terms of the setup to your question, in some respects, this is the worst I've actually ever seen. And the reason I say that is if you look, compare it, say, to the NASDAQ bus in 2000, we didn't have the everything bubble then. What we had was the technology sector disintermediating everything else. These, these tech stocks went to crazy, crazy valuations. And so when they cracked, there was something else to buy. You could buy Levitt's furniture, you know, on six times earnings with a dividend yield higher than the PE. Value was really cheap. Point is, you didn't have people running around as you have now saying, oh, you know, Target's are really a technology company or Starbucks is a technology company or Under Armour is a technology company, right? And then for those which had no possible technology aura, uh, you know, perfectly good companies, decent balance sheets, Single digit PEs, you know, five, six percent yields. There was something to buy. So, in other words, yeah, technology sucked the disintermediated everything else. All right. And so, this everything bubble that we have now, we didn't have that the last time. So, I think we have seen a generational peak 
evaluations with all the attendant consequences. I think things like um, private equity, where evaluation multiples went insane. It's like you know, people paying up uh, a few more handles of EBITDA with leveraged money, like what could possibly go wrong? Or unicorns, companies that come public uh, or don't come public, they don't, they don't make money and they don't scale. In other words, I think a lot of these projects, a lot of these investments would have never seen the light of day if we had a more normal cost of capital. And that's yeah. what's happening is we're normalizing the cost of capital. So we'll, we'll find we'll find out you know who's skinny dipping. Warren Buffett, please call your office. George, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but for the sake of argument, and I think it'd just be entertaining and interesting for the audience to see. I'm going to adopt the the opinions of someone who you might see on financial television, who's you know who is very bullish and just has a very bullish bias, and is sort of uh, dismisses the bearish arguments that you make. So uh, let's just say, uh, let's you know, going going forward, I'm going to be doing that. Um, you know, so George, look, profits they're going to come in, uh, they're, but they're you know they're, it, the economy is going to rebound. Inflation is is falling incredibly sharply. So the Federal Reserve is going to stop hiking and you know interest rates are going to fall. So you're going to get that double thing of inflation falling down, earnings going up, uh, and interest rates going down. So it's going to be, you know, S&P 5000. Oh, and by the way, George, all those companies that you said are, you know, the oat milk company that went public at a $17 billion valuation, guess what? It's now trading at $2 billion. It's, it's, you were right, George. All these companies, they went down 80%. But come on, it, it, there's value there. So, wait, so Jack, you're long beyond meat now? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oatly was the stock I'm referring to. I've never uh, had a position. By the way, I forgot to short that. We'll have to look at it. Um, so as Jim Bianco likes to say, um, you know, he says he's an inflationista for three reasons. The three factors which which uh, kept inflation down, cheap labor. Well, we've we run out of labor with full employment. Cheap goods. Now, with import tariffs and, and all the rest, you saw what we did with uh, China the other day with the semiconductor stuff and cheap energy. So, you know, Jack, well, how long ago was it? It was a year ago. I chose the power of narrative. A year ago, it was a little more than a year ago, when the inflation numbers first started heating up. Remember how everyone became an expert on used car prices? <laughs> It was all used car prices, right? Okay, all right, okay. The Mannheim Index, we all know, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, actually, actually, it reminds me. You know, we let's see. Let me get this straight. Back in eighteen, we all came. We came experts, armchair experts on uh, trade policy with China. Yep. Then we all became experts uh, on. We all became ex armchair virologists on uh, vaccines. Uh, Then we all became experts on foreign relations with Putin. And now everyone's a yield curve expert. And by the way, Jack, if you start with me, I love this too. Well, you know, that's the twos, tens. No, 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 no. You got to look at the three year, 10 year. Okay. You have people blowing smoke. They have no idea what they're talking about. So please don't ask me yield curve questions. All right. Well, George, you, you can't look at the 10 2 spread. You got to look at the 10 year and then the three month spread from a year ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And by that metric, you know, Sky, the full blue sky ahead. Sure. Well, this goes to narrative again, right? Um, so, um, you know, the inflation thing is hard to say before. The three factors that have kept inflation down uh, no longer apply. Uh, they're no longer um, operative. And so, again, this goes back to regime change. We talked about it a lot the last time. I think we mentioned it here today so far a couple times. In the post- GFC era, okay, the bond market has consistently overestimated inflation. It kept thinking inflation was going to pick up, inflation was going to pick up, and rates would pick up, and they never did, and they never did, and they never did, up until the time of COVID. Now what I think has happened, and Jim has spoken eloquently about this, because we've run out of labor, and because we really run out of cheap energy, and imports are becoming more expensive because of deglobalization. I think the likelihood, in my opinion, is as opposed to the past decade, where markets consistently overestimated inflation, I think they're now going to consistently 
underestimate inflation. I uh, saw a vigorous debate the other day. Someone was making the case. I won't mention names. And let's, let's leave them in the Federal Witness Protection Program. But they were making the case that bonds were, were attractive at a 380 yield because they're saying, oh, you know, if you look at the long term inflation expectations of 2%, you know, 1.8% real yield is a good deal. Well, who says the bond market's right? The bond market, if you look at their record, has been horribly wrong. So just because. I know, Jack, you're a big issue in swaptions in five-year, five-year forwards. So, um, you know, you have, to, you have to humor me. But people say, oh, look at the forward rate. Okay, well, so what? That's like saying for a stock. Imagine you said for a stock, oh, look at the earnings estimate for two, two years from now. We can't even get the earnings estimate right now. We can't even get it correct for this year. So people are going to tell you you should take to the bank the earnings estimate the street has for XYZ company. Are you crazy? So when people say, oh, Inflation expectations remain anchored. Well, that's because they haven't gotten a memo, according in my view. So, if you actually think that inflation will remain, at, you know, long term two percent or whatever, then that would take the wind out of my sails to a large degree about my bearish view for equities. But I think we're in a in a brave new world with um, uh, higher inflation, much more economic volatility. Um, geopolitical risk, um, and, and it's, it's a much different environment. So coming back to your bull case, I think the multiple is going to go down and stay down uh, because the slower growth, volatile economic environment with uh, higher interest rates is not conducive to high PEs. In fact, I go back to the beginning of the discussion where I said equities have only gone down a lockstep with the rise in bond yields. As a matter of fact, Equities have not gone down enough if you look at how much bond yields have gone up. You look at the so-called equity risk premium, okay? The equity risk premium, there's a lot of work on this. You can, it's out there. The equity risk premium should be uh, uh, 100, 150 basis points higher than it is right now, which would take off a couple of handles on the, on, on the PE ratio for the S&P. And so I think the PE ratio is flattened down from here. And then on earnings, we are earning, company earnings are so far above trend, you detrend earnings, in part because we've had this massive fiscal stimulus, and it's an economic identity. The fiscal, the, the public sector deficit is equal to the private sector surplus. And so as, as that stimulus gets pulled back, as we go into fiscal contraction relative to where we were before, that's a negative for corporate profits. So I, I think prop, corporate profits do mean revert. Okay, around a trend, but they do mean revert. And valuations mean revert. I don't want to get into, you know, talk about you know, the Schiller Cape Ratio or the Warren Buffett indicator or John Hussman. All that stuff is, is, is uniformly bearish and negative. And so it doesn't mean the market has to tank, but what it tells you is that um, over the next few years, returns from equities are likely to be extremely poor, extremely poor. So I think to be bullish here, you have to believe that profit margins will not mean revert. In other words, capitalism is broken. That's that, you know, labor's wanting its share, its pound of flesh, uh, and that capital will not give up, will not give up on margins. And you also have to believe that inflation is gonna go, that we will go back to Kansas again, we'll get inflation down to 2%, and, within tenant expansion and PE ratios. I just don't think that's the case. That's where I differ. But what if, so I think you also are pricing in or something, something of a significant economic slowdown, a recession, perhaps a global recession. Recessions historically are very effective at tamping down inflation. And you know, we are seeing some like harbingers of not deflation, but disinflation in the system. Like shipping rates have absolutely collapsed over the past few months. The chemicals industry, uh, they just had a, they just now did, like they had a chemicals, you know, huge chemicals party basically in uh, Germany. Except it wasn't a party because the mood was so bearish. Uh, and they're saying like you know the the refining parts of the of the big oil companies, not like refining it into jet fuel, but refining it into chemicals that are used for like naphtha and stuff for like chem like packaging and stuff. They're going to lose money, which is almost never happens. Mm -hmm. um, so it's looking very, it's looking very bearish for the, for the global economy. Isn't that the time the Fed liquidity has to come back in? Because anytime there's a recession, 
you know, I mean, look, you, the Fed, the Fed comes back in. The Fed, the Fed can't just let sort of the 1930s happen again with the Great Depression, right? Yeah. So the buy, Fed, come on, George, buy. The, the, Fed, the Fed will come back in. The question is that from what level? So it's not the prediction, but how you get to the prediction. If you're saying to me, hey, you know what, we're gonna have a big recession, and that's gonna bring all these prices down, and that's gonna bring labor costs down, and we'll get inflation down, okay. But implicit in your scenario, Jack, what does it mean for earnings? You know, so again, you can't have it both ways. The way to get inflation down is to have a recession. Have a recession, we have down earnings. You tell me what the earnings are going to be. Not 200. That's, that's not Goldman Sachs barricade. 250. 250. 300. 300 well, with a 30 multiple. 9,000. Well, then, 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 then you're suggesting some, this would be extraordinary to have corporate profitability, uh, uh remain, uh, exit unscathed through a recession. And as a matter of fact, it almost doesn't make any sense because the reason companies lay off people is because their profitability, uh, turns down. Maybe they start losing money. So if companies are continuing to make, to make profits, they're not going to let people go. So it just it doesn't add up, in my, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and what about growth companies that have sold off 80%, 70%? Like Netflix and Meta, formerly Facebook, I think are, are down over 50%. Uh, the Netflix, Netflix significantly more. I mean, come on, you have a high quality company that's profitable, that's making money, growing its revenues, and it's down 50%. You got to buy that, George, right? Um, yes and no. I think you have to, I don't want to get caught up in uh, the idiosyncratic nature of any one individual stock. Yeah. But one needs to be careful, um, about the difference between gap and non-gap earnings. So at the peak of the cycle, the, uh, the the spread between gap and non-gap earnings tends to be at, at its widest. So, and that's important because things like stock-based compensation, and uh, Netflix is a big uh, offender in that regard, CRM is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, again, I don't want to get caught up in any one individual yeah. stock, but okay. you need to consider you know, a company like CRM, a company like Netflix, if they have been benefiting from the fact they uh, were able to engage for years in a liberal application of uh, a stock option, stock-based compensation, right? lieu of cash compensation. And now number number no go up no more. And so the stock options are perceived not to be worth as much. And in order to uh, attract and retain people, they have to start paying higher cash compensation, or they have to restrike more options at an even lower price, which gives you more dilution. I mean, there's been this sort of Rube Goldbergian perpetual money machine aspect to a lot of this. Um, the whole system has been on steroids. And if the movie runs in reverse, you may find that there's a sort of reflexive uh, downward spiral uh, as a result of this. So, um, you know, if you look, I mean, at the end of the day, it gets back to know what you own. And, you know, there are plenty of companies out there. I, you know, it's easy to say bullish in the market, bearish in the market. This year, the only real place to have made money was energy stocks. All right. Incredibly it's cheap. Actually, it's factually true on a passive basis. That's absolutely true. Yeah. yeah probably, you know, probably the only sector that's up in the S&P. I'm pretty sure. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And, um, you know, know what you own as a company, are you, know, are you generating cash flow? What's the valuation like? Uh, what's the balance sheet like? Um, and I'm sure another thing I, I, I'm encouraged by actually coming out of this mess, I think it's going to be a much better environment for stock picking. Um, indexation has been all the rage uh, the last few years because, you know, it's generally true in the aggregate that active managers underperform the indices. It has to be because the sum of all portfolios is equal to the 
market return, less transaction costs. So if you have active managers spinning their wheels trading a lot, running up commissions, or even more important, commissions are next to nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, always always buying on the bid and selling on the offer. You'll find that active managers over time will underperform the market. There are times though when they underperform the market, a greater proportion underperform the market than others. And in a in a, in a liquidity driven bull market like we've had the last few years, where there've been a lot of large cap growth stocks that have just killed it, uh, and the market breadth hasn't been that good, it's been particularly difficult to beat the market. In a way, it kind of reminds me of the Japanese market when um, you know Japan went from 28, 20 some odd percent of EFA, that's the Europe Australian Far East index. That's really a non uh, US S&P, if you will. Mm-hmm. If you're running money in farm markets, that's what you benchmark against. But I recall in the 80s, Japan was like 20 some odd percent of EFA. It got up to 66% of EFA. You had, you had Japanese banks selling on 100 times earnings and 10 times book. But dude, mm-hmm. number. But but number go up, bro. So yeah. it didn't matter whether Farley Industries was a good stock idea or not. It was a small cap; nobody cared. If you didn't own Sumitomo Bank or Mitsubishi Bank, and I think what's happened in this environment, there was a narrative around that too. In this environment, it's all into technology and the future and the internet and all that kind of good stuff. And these yes, these these are great companies, but they got too expensive. And now we're finding. In some cases, you know, not all fang stocks are created equal. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, on technology, but, you know, from what I've been able to read and understand, you know, Meta has serious business issues. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, Microsoft, the worst thing I've read is that people say it's expensive. No one said to me, Hey, this is a problem, this business or that business. Mm-hmm. And so know what you own, just chasing a narrative and hugging the index. I think those days are over. So there's, is there any part of the stock you're broadly very bearish on stocks and it sounds like on high valuation technology companies, you're particularly bearish on, is there anything in the stock market universe you like, or do you just think you should be in cash? Well, like, I told advice. For most people, most people, they should be in cash. Uh, and now, you know, there is, you know, as I joked last time, you know, Tina is dead. FOMO is dead. Goldilocks is dead. Okay. Where's Tina, by the way, George? Where's Tina? Uh, some people have said, I think this, this is a concept making a making a, a run for now called Tata. Treasuries are the alternative. I don't know. And then someone said to me there was something else. Whatever. I mean, as you've been in some of my spaces, Jack, and some smart cookies have said, you know what? I can park my money in two year treasuries and you know make four point three percent. That's not so bad. Um, and, you know, keep it simple, stupid to invoke one of Dan Scartman's trading rules, do more of what's working and less of not less of what's not working. And recently, you know, how many times have you bought something that actually made money and how many times have you bought something that actually lost money? So fear of missing out, um, I think is, uh, receding. Uh, I'm curious and we'll look with interest, particularly the next few months. We're going to be getting, uh, I believe, tax loss selling. I also think you're going to see significant redemptions from hedge funds and, and whatnot. Also coinciding with um, the onset of winter in Europe and all the craziness that's going on. It's tragic. This is going to uh, take the over on late. This is not. There's no. There's no short-term resolution to this thing. This is going to go on for a while. And so, um, you know, tax loss selling. Um, we're just going off the ski cliff on earnings right now. Um, I think bad news is going to be bad news on the earnings front. I guess what I really would say, a very key distinction here, we are certainly in a bear market for earnings. That is part of, but not necessarily saying that we're in a bear market for stocks. Two, two different things. Um, again, you know, there's a real economy and there's the stock market. They're not always the same. But I, th- I think I think earnings are still, you know, are, are really starting to fall apart meaningfully. You threw out the two hundred Sachs, two hundred dollar Goldman Sachs number. That would be like the best case scenario. I've seen. Which some is estimate. Goldman Sachs' worst case scenario, by the way? I, I think. I, 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 I understand. I, I'd eat my hat if it comes in at two hundred. Um, you know, Michael Belkin's been in our space, and he cited one hundred and ten dollars. Now maybe that's too draconian. But if I said to you, Jack, you know, forget about one ten. He's too bearish. You know, do I hear 170, 180? I mean, again, 
The index is at 3,600. So we'll be talking about that here, which was kind of informed to what I said to you earlier. I can easily see the market going below 3,000 uh, in, in the next few months. The only reason it wouldn't, the only the most likely reason it wouldn't, would be something happens, something really bad happens to cause the Fed to freeze in its tracks and pivot. Um, but that thing, that thing, would not be positive for the stock market. So then that begs another question. I was mixing up with somebody on Twitter the other day. We're in this mode right now where bad news is good news. The idea being that if we get soft economic data, soft inflation data, yeah. that would cause the, the Fed to be more uh, lenient. I wonder, I wonder, I'm not making a prediction, but I wonder if once we get through this whole thing, if the idea is, you know what, margins went down, but all they've done is revert to normal. P's went down, but all they did was revert to normal. And if we're left to an environment where because inflation is a little bit higher than it's been normally, they can't print a ton of money, um, so you don't get a liquidity-driven market, and profit margins, you know, they had the big expansion, they contract, they're back to normal, and all the factors just gave you those high profit margins, namely cheap labor, cheap goods, cheap money, cheap energy, that those go away. But you could be in a situation where margins don't do anything. And if a large part of the return from equities the last decade or two has been from multiple expansion, we take P expansion off the table. So no multiple expansion for Jack, no profit margin expansion for Jack. What's that left? What does that leave you with? And, and, and so, and, and again, this wouldn't be so bad, but I think the public, again, I want to go back on something we talked earlier a few minutes ago. All this money that piled into equities, you know, and very little of it's come out. And, and, and because whether, you know, their financial advisors told them to stay in or whatever, and um, I, to me, I could be wrong. I don't think this cycle's over on the downside until some appreciable part of that money comes out. In other words, you see puking for the retail community. And maybe they won't. I don't know. But that's, that's one of the things I'm looking for. So if you were to ask me, you have it, but I expect you will, what would make me more, be more bullish? Mm -hmm. If I saw more, if I, if, I, if, I, if I saw capitulation, I don't think we've seen capitulation. Yeah. Uh, if I saw that inflation really had come down to, you know, an acceptable level, um, and, and if we had some diminution of the, all these geopolitical concerns that we have, there's just there's just so many ways to lose right now. I know I know people will say, well, oh, well, gee, George, there's always something to worry about. Yeah, that's true, but we have, in my opinion, a very unusual set of circumstances now. Leaving aside what's going on in the world geopolitically and otherwise. Again, we've had the everything bubble. We're now unwinding that. We're having the everything bear market, and that process has not run its course, in my opinion. How, uh, how how big of a drawdown do you think it will be before the the bubble has fully popped, and how long do you think that will be? Like, do you think the bottom will be within the next six months, nine months, or will it you know take as long as two years for us to fully bottom? Well, inspired by. Um, Michael Kantrowitz, who points out the incredible role that housing plays in the economy. We haven't really talked much about housing. Um, I believe, Jack, uh, you probably heard Ivy Zillman we had, we had over the summer. He's the premier housing analyst in the country. But my real takeaway from her remarks, it's not that we have excesses in the mortgage-backed securities market a la 2008. We don't. We don't. History rhymes, it doesn't repeat itself. What was scary for me was the amount of hidden supply in the system. Specifically, she points out that fully 24% of housing transactions, 24%, were involving non-primary buyers. That is to say, it's Blackstone buying up portfolio houses, or it's build to rent. Or it's Airbnb. Or a Chinese billionaire or something. Chinese billionaire. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. And uh, in, in Toto, those uh, sources of demand uh, amounted to 24% of housing demand. And that's very price sensitive demand. 
you know, everyone's buying the house to put an Airbnb out of it because they can, you know, charge whatever, 300 bucks a night, get over from buying a rent. And so that acted as an accelerant for housing prices on the way up. But when it turns and it has turned, it's going to be act as an accelerant on the way down. I put it in my Twitter feed a couple weeks ago. It was a great graph that showed mortgage obligation payments as a percentage of disposable income. The absolute level of the number is not important. What's important is context, where the relative history. I think it was up to like 25%, which is as high as it's been any time in the last 40 years. For new mortgages. Like if, if I got a mortgage a year and a half ago, I'd still be paying my super low rate. But yeah, for new mortgages. Yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. And if you recall, the economist Herbert Stein, he crafted what came to be known as Stein's Law which is that which can't go on, it won't. Like that's not a sustainable set of affairs. And so you're okay, Jack. You bought your house last year. You're paying a three, three and a half percent mortgage. But the problem now is for anyone who wants to, is considering moving, what was a liability named their mortgage is now their asset. Because you have a home with a three percent mortgage. You go to buy and you got to pay, I hear mortgage rates are as high as seven to five ace now. Mm -hmm. So you consider that the average house was, I think, appreciated by 40% in the last two years, some number like that. I know it's rolling over now, but roughly speaking, it went from, you know, 300,000 to 420,000, some number like that. You take a 40% increase in the um, price of the house combined with an increase in mortgage rates from whatever, four to seven, and the effective payment for someone buying a new home it was up by like, I don't know, 60, 80, 90%, whatever the number is, all right? So housing is really at risk. Ivy made the call earlier in the summer before this became a thing. And based on what I've been able to ascertain, it's really extraordinary how fast housing is falling apart. I don't want to get caught up in anecdotes. Everyone's yeah. got anecdotes with somebody. Okay. And you know, they always say housing is a very local market. Um the markets where mortgage finance is not as necessary, i.e. the high end of the market where people pay, pay cash, it won't be as hard hit. But I think housing is falling apart at a breakneck speed right now, which again, going back to the top of the conversation, what's different, that's different. Mm -hmm. So the most interest-sensitive parts of the economy, housing being most notable, maybe to a lesser extent auto, but certainly housing, starting to take a hit. And this, this will flow through, I mean, as we know, Interest rates have a, uh, a variable and long lag in terms of the impact on the economy. And those who claim that the Fed's overcooking it say that, well, by dint of what they've already done, if they just wait, you know, it'll, it'll take effect. But again, my problem is I have no doubt that inflation's in that. I have no problem with anyone who says inflation's peak. My problem is I think the trajectory of inflation declines is taken for granted um, uh, by market participants. And if I were to say to you, hey, you know what, Jack, let's say next spring inflation's at five, you just make up a number. Five, still a problem. So no easy money for you. No easy money for yeah. managers, uh, managing portfolios, investing in loss-making companies. Right, and 5% uh, inflation, even if like the smart economists, the macro people say, oh, it's 5%, but it's headed to 2%, the Fed can't just say, oh, the smart economists on whose models we rely are saying this, so we're going to do it. No, they have because they they totally they uh, they they lost the chance to they lost the faith. Yeah. They have they have to be data driven, evidence based. Uh, but, but George, so my question of how when do you think the bottom will will be? Looking at where ISM orders are and historically the trajectory of these things, the economy is not likely to bottom out until next summer. And which is another uh, pet peeve. Right. And, but the great. stock market typically bottoms before the, the economic market, right? The well, well, yes. Let me be a little more, more specific. Uh, and, and Michael Cantritz is on Twitter. He's a must follow. People who like to uh, point out that, oh, well, every time the market's been so, this oversold, it's gone up. And you see all these like Ned Davis type studies, and they say, well, you know, Whenever the market's been more than X percent below the 200-day moving average and you get a breast thrust and blah, 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 on average, it's gone up 19.6% over the next six months, whatever. By the way, 
If I had a nickel for every time I heard the term breath thrust two weeks ago, we wouldn't be having this interview. I'd be on an island somewhere. Okay, so <laughs> just keep in mind the power of the narrative. Okay, the market turns not because it's oversold, not because sentiment's negative. The market turns because the thing which is causing sentiment to be negative, it could be interest rates, it could be the dollar, it could be Fed policy. Whatever the fundamental thing is that is causing the sentiment to be negative and the market to be down, it's when that thing turns. So if housing demand collapses and the Fed does nothing, I wouldn't expect anything. But if housing demand collapses and inflation gets down to the appropriate level, and then they decide to turn on the spigot, okay, mm -hmm. market goes back up. So to come to your question, you know, I hope we do another interview six months from now or five months yeah, from now. Sure. We can revisit. But I, but I think the next few months look decidedly negative for all the reasons that we've been discussing here. My final question, I, I want the real fireworks, the George Noble fireworks to come out. But before we do that, just to tease it for the audience, tell us about your new ETF, uh, whose tip, ticker is NOPE, N-O-P-E. Why did you create it? What type of stuff does it invest in? And you know, what environments does it perform well in and, and, and stuff like that? I never thought I was going to run a fund again, but I got a tremendous amount of inbound inquiries from people um, who like what they were hearing in the spaces and would ask about to run money. I said, all right, I'll give it a try. And it's basically um, going back to my roots. Um, it's meant to be an absolute return vehicle. As we say in the, uh, the company literature, just say no to uh, bubbles say no to ignoring valuation, say no to indexation. In a world where flat is the new up, and most every investment people are making is geared towards markets going up. It's an index fund, it's a tech fund, it's a blockchain fund, it's a cannabis fund. Um, what do you do if we get into an environment, forget about being a bear market, what if watches launches there's nothing in the next five years? And I actually think, doing nothing in the next five years is going to be a good return in nominal terms, forget about real terms. So this product is designed to try to make money in all kinds of markets. It could be long, it could be short. It's opportunistic. Mm -hmm. It's uncorrelated to the general indices. We may not be successful in our, in our objective, but our objective is to try to make money in all environments. And I think it's really unique um, insofar as it's, it's essentially putting a hedge fund into an ETF. Mm -hmm. And it's got tremendous advantages insofar as it's, it's, it's far cheaper than hedge funds. The management fees 98 basis points. It's completely liquid. You can just hit a button and buy it or sell it. It's completely transparent uh, because you can just, the holdings are there on the, on the website every night. And it gets better tax treatment as all ETFs do. Uh, and finally, for the average investor who maybe doesn't qualify for a hedge fund, you have to be a qualified investor. You can just buy this. Mm -hmm. So it's meant to be an absolute return vehicle. Uh, it's really a diversifier for people's portfolio. They shouldn't put all their money into this yeah. thing. But I also like to think that part of what we're doing in the spaces, and Jack, you've got a big supporter of the spaces. We've been trying to educate people. That's the old line, you know, you, you give someone a fish, you give them a meal, you teach them how to fish, you give them a livelihood. And I think being in our spaces and seeing what we're doing in the fund, um, I think it's really, really helped the people's financial literacy. And we have a real community that we've built out here. And I think it'll make them better investors for the rest of the portfolio. So we'll see. It's exciting. It's, uh, there is a real dearth of actively managed ETFs yes. out there. 99% plus of ETFs are tied to an index or a group or whatever. This is not tied to anything. This could go up, this could go down, uh, but it's meant to be an absolute trend. And George, I saw the holdings as of, I think, yesterday or, or last night, and it had a lot of cash, and then it had a, you know maybe a small amount of gold stuff there, but then a much larger short, something that was short stuff. So stocks, basically short stocks. So if those holdings are representative of what it will hold in the future. Would it be safe to say that it would have a negative correlation to the S&P 500? 
if if the, if those holdings were the same in the future. Yeah. But again, so subject to change without notice. I mean, let's put it this way: I have to be careful what I say. Uh, but you know, anyone listening to this interview or the prior interview would know that I'm uh, bearish. So for for you to buy lots of risk assets and for you to buy Arc and stuff like that and to have a positive correlation to SPY, you would have to be bearish. So it's likely it's you're bullish. Excuse me. So it's likely that this thing. It seems to me. And again, what do I know? That this will have a negative correlation to the S P five hundred unless you stop being bearish and you start becoming bullish. Is that a reasonable thing to say? Yeah, yeah that theoretical, that hypothetical is correct. But again, this is an active product. I will say one other thing. Um, I don't mind the scrutiny, um, but it's interesting. I'm in a fishbowl right now because every trade I make, people can see at the end of the day what the portfolio is. So yeah. I can run, but I can hide. You and Kathy uh, would. You and any- Kathy would too. You're in the same boat. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Let's put this. Way. Let's put. I will say this. I will say this. Yeah, I gotta be careful what I say. This is not SR. This is not SR. The short ARK ETF. Yeah. If people want. If people want to bet against Kathy exclusively. Do not invest in this fund. I am running this the same way I would run a hedge fund. Yeah. When I'm bearish, I'm bearish. When I'm bullish, I'm bullish. And I'm actually very excited about the opportunities I see coming up. I hope we do get a big, I hope, I mean, if we do get a big bear market, well, sorry, if we get, if this market continues the way I think it will be, there'll be plenty of opportunities to get long. As a matter of fact, um, there are times I've been accused of being a perma bear, but I'd like to point out to people that some of my biggest successes in my career were actually from being long. I mean, I had the, I had a, I'll let people look the record up themselves. I can't say too much, but my success at Fidelity was by dint of my being bullish. And one of my best careers, one, two of my best years ever running hedge funds was when I was bullish. So I'm not a one trick pony. This card doesn't just go in reverse. So it also goes forward. And how can people find out about the ETF? Like I've looked it up and it's listed on ETF databases and stuff, but do you guys have a website? Yeah. If you go to, uh, noblefunds.com noblefunds.com has is a website it's got the holdings on it there's also a presentation deck it explains our process um there's also a corporate website which we're developing but for right here right now noblefunds.com has the data you need to make a decision i believe it explains our process we we have a um a uh, investment clock, a four quadrant process. The investment clock. This concept was first pioneered by Charles Gow of Govcal and David Bowers of Merrill Lynch uh, back in the eighties and nineties. Others have adopted it, but um, essentially, we're not uh, pure bottom of stock pickers. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big believer that get that fund structure is actually more important than the individual names. That if you get the sectors and the factors right, that's ninety percent of the battle. In fact, as Michael Cantor would say, factors are nothing more than a bunch of but sectors are nothing more than a bunch of factors. But we try to combine the micro, the bottom up, with the macro, the big picture view. You've been hearing nothing but big picture nonsense from me for the last hour. And, 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 then, and then the technicals. What is what are what are the charts? What, what's the chart for? What's the stock right. So um, it should check all those boxes: micro, macro, and the chart should be. I'll give you just one example. If you had a housing stock, let's say which maybe because it's come down so much starts to look cheap on a static analysis, but earnings estimates are likely to go down in the future given what's happening in the housing demand. Uh, it's in the wrong quadrant because rates are going up and the chart might look terrible. We just wouldn't be involved. So when something, something's conflicted, we just won't be involved. When something is positive, so positive on micro, macro, and technicals, we'll own it. When something's negative on... Uh, macro, micro, um, and, and, and charts will short it. And so we, we, it's a sort of disciplined, um, uh, systematized approach. Yeah. George, my final question, I'm going to, you know, sort of be giving you the firebrand and I want, I want you to throw it. I want you to throw it as hard as you can. Tell me about the frogs in the pot and tell me about how, uh, there's a lot of complacency out there. What do you mean by that? And, yeah, what what you know? But you said portfolio managers 
uh, are complacent. What do you mean by that? And so if you're a professional money manager, risk is defined in a way which may be surprising for most individual investors. For most individuals, I think they would define risk as the likelihood of losing money. I buy ARK, I buy Tesla. What's the chance I'm going to lose money? Um, for professional investors, they are tethered to benchmarks and they define risk instead of they look at their tracking error and what's the likelihood they're going to underperform the index. So for instance, if you were bearish on uh, JP Morgan and you don't like JP Morgan for whatever the reasons, and let's say JP Morgan's 1% of the index. I'm just making this example up. Well, if JP Morgan stock goes up and you don't own it, you're in trouble. So you're defining risk as sort of like a relative performance benchmark. You're defining risk as the as extent to which you'll deviate or could deviate from the index return. Not am I going to make or lose money. And this is an outgrowth of the decade of the of the regime we've been in, where generally speaking, it's true you want to be fully invested. In fact, holding cash has been a source of negative alpha. You, you know, market goes up 15, 20%, you hold cash, you're toast. So um, there's been a real pressure to uh, stay fully invested. I know many people, look, this is a hard business. I mean, you know, you and I just been, you know, spitballing here. It's not an easy business. And, you know, if individuals are confused, don't worry, so are, so aren't the professionals. I, I, I can't recall a time that it was more difficult to uh, manage money than is the case right now. If your concept of risk is the more appropriate risk, the old-fashioned notion of risk, which is what's it like that I'm going to lose money? You know, if you sell Apple or you sell Amazon or you sell JP Morgan or Tesla, whatever it is, and you're quote unquote naked, I mean, look, take Apple, it's 7% of the index. Yeah. You don't own Apple and it goes up, all right? But on the other hand, you might say, you know what? Gee, Apple looks pretty expensive compared to history and growth is slowing a lot and yada, yada, yada. So what's happened is there's been a perversion of, there's been a distortion of incentives. And the, I think, I think the investing public has been very poorly served by the street, by the, by wealth managers, by RIAs. And I don't mean to say all wealth managers are bad or all RIA managers are bad. Not at all. But if you've gone through this year and your RIA or your wealth manager has not changed your portfolio, that the portfolio he has you in now is the same as it was on January 1st, then I, I would urge you to strongly consider whether you're with the right uh, RIA because there is no such thing as set it and forget it. And when it comes to indexation, uh, I can't remember who said it, but you know, what the, what the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. And everyone's, you know, indexation has become all the rage. We know all the reasons, you know, you're not going to underperform and most managers underperform, and the fees are less and so on and so forth. But when the very thing you're indexed to is unattractive, I go back to my Japanese bank example in the late 80s, you want to be as far away from the index as possible. And so what I really, um, frustrated with is the um, they call it the, the democratization of, uh, of our industry whenever I hear that term you should like run not walk as fast as you can away from who's ever handing you that nonsense and for someone to say oh just click this just click that no problem I'm good bro okay it'd be like Jack imagine you or I are at home okay and you got to do an open heart operation on your wife don't worry, I got this. I watched the YouTube video, okay? This is not an easy business. The problem is the streets made it too easy for people, and they have a vested interest to keep the game going as it is because going back to the frog and the pot thing you asked me about, look, they got you just where they want. You're in an index fund. You're in a 60-40 fund. The, by the way, the worst year in history ever for the 60-40 portfolio. It's because stocks and bonds are correlated before they were inversely correlated, all right? Um, and so they have all the incentives to keep you in the pot because they'll keep charging you those management fees, right? And again, you know, how do you, how do you cook a frog? You turn the water, the heat up ever so slowly so it doesn't jump out. 
And that's what's been going on here. Um, you've heard me say before, Jack, sell is not a four-letter word. And, and the importance of that, I mean, to be, make a joke out of it. The reason folks like Seth Klarman or Howard Marks or uh, uh, Paul Singer uh, make money is because when the proverbial hits the fan, they have liquidity, they have cash to be able to buy stuff with. As opposed to if you're fully invested all the way down, you don't, you're not able to take advantage of those opportunities. And so when I say to people, it's actually in holding cash that you're generating alpha, they're like, what are you talking about? And it's not, it's not, oh, I held cash and made one or two percent of the market went down 20. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's true. But more importantly, when the market finally hits bottom and your neighbor is getting margin called because he's levering some meme stocks, you on the other hand, you have cash. And they're giving the stuff away. So, okay, we're not, none of us are Warren Buffett. I get it. But go back to the GFC where, you know, credit was tight. Banks didn't have much liquidity. But, you know, Goldman needed money. Bank of America needed money. GE needed money. Boeing needed money. He was there. And he was able to get, you know, command pretty good terms. So, the, the, the idea of stocks for the long term, you always have to be fully invested. I disagree with that. Um, but again, it's a function of regime. In a world where markets only go up, why would you hold cash? But if we're in more of a stopgap uh, world, uh, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down, you need to be more tactical. Um, and, and, and I think, I think timing markets, if you know what you're doing, is actually um, the sensible thing to do. George, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on. We got to do this again in six months. It'll be interesting to see where the S&P is, where ARK is, where your ETF is. Uh, folks should check you out on Twitter at GNoble79. You have fantastic spaces with fantastic guests. I actually saw you're going to be hosting a space soon with, quote, Mr. X. So is this a guest so good that we're not allowed to know who's, whose name it is? I will say this. This person, I don't want to spoil the fun. I'll let it out in a few days. But this fellow, aside from being really interesting investor, well known in a part of the world that's very topical right now, you will not be disappointed. I promise you. Um, by the way, we've had as many as I think sixty thousand people in our spaces. It's incredible. I'm going for I'm going for a hundred thousand on this one. We'll Let's see what it. happens. Well, uh, George, thanks so much. I'll be listening. Take care. Take care, Jack. Thank you.